Hello and welcome to the sound of where we are. My name is John Roach and I'm an associate professor at Parsons School of Design in New York City in the United States. I wanted to share my experience teaching a class called Sound Matters, which I've taught for many years. Of course, in fall 2020, this is what Parsons looked like for me, and I found myself teaching this course for the first time remotely. Sound Matters aims to introduce students to the ways that sound cuts across disciplines and impacts our perception of the world. An important emphasis is on the impact that sound has on our understanding the built environment. First, I'd like to give you a little bit of framing. Geographically, most of my students in fall 2020 were on the east coast of the United States, and I had one outlier in Shanghai. They were an incredibly heterogeneous group, representing nearly every undergraduate program at Parsons, which is ideal for me since I'm interested in the transdisciplinary potential of sound. The 15-week semester moves through different frames for engaging with sound, from perceptual and environmental to technological and physiological and psychological, to semiotic, to spatial. There are a series of staged projects that move from the role of sound and memory, to explorations of recording and transmitting sound, to engaging with the way that we add sound to the world, and finally, to the exploration of sound and sight. And I'll focus on this final project in this presentation, but I'll dip into some of the other projects to highlight some connections and the experiences of retooling a class for a remote environment. Here's a little uh, description from the project handout I gave my students. In the final project, you'll explore the sound of a site close to you and create something for that place. The final project will be a site-specific work that explores the nature of sound at a place nearby that you have access to. The work that you create could take many forms, for example, an acousmatic sound work, a performance, an interactive piece, a participatory event, a service, even a visual piece about sound. Like many of us, I reworked projects that I'd created for an online context. When this class ran on site, the students selected locations around campus and um, they created work specifically for those spaces. And the class ended in a tour of the various projects that we uh, encountered and we experienced them together. That was clearly not possible in fall 2020, so it opened up an interesting possibility. What happens when they select a site where they are? What's gained or lost when the work is not experienced in an embodied way on site? Here's the trajectory of the project. The phases remain more or less the same as the on-site version, but of course the delivery and the way students engaged were very different. They begin by going out and selecting three different sites that they might want to work with, through conversation, they narrow it down to one site. They then move on to research, develop and prototype, and then present the work. So just to um, give you an example of maybe what things looked like in the old world of the on-site version of the class, um, this was a student who chose three sites in one building, staircase, bathroom, storage, and another student uh, who actually chose three different sites in very different places. So I really was not sure what this new approach was going to reveal. I kind of imagined that it was going to be a bit of a slot machine. Um, and, you know, first I knew that it was going to be subject to certain limitations imposed by the pandemic. The level of access to sites, the comfort level of students being in public, whether or not um, the student shared a space with someone in a high-risk category, these things could really um, shape the kinds of choices that they might make. This is my student from Delaware. Um, some of the themes that I saw in his three choices were this idea of home, things that really surrounded his lo location there in Delaware, and also what you may not be able to see in that last image is these kind of charged spaces as well. My student in Boston um, focused on these kind of interstitial spots, these places um, of transit or, um, you know, between industrial zones and um, public zones, things like that. This student from Manhattan really kind of took a broad approach and cast the net wide at three very different locations. This student also in Manhattan um, took a varied approach as well, but really more sort of tooled to the kinds of topics she was interested in. And so in this case, we have this idea of these public leisure spaces, um, these sites of uh, movement, uh, 
And also then, uh, by contrast, her own home, in particular her messy kitchen and the sink. This student wanted to zero in on her industrial um, surroundings in Bushwick, Brooklyn, while my student in Shanghai really focused on three sites related to public spaces, transit, um, common areas in a Shanghai housing uh, unit, and also a coffee shop. So the next step was to narrow it down. So here is the final selection from these students. Here's the majors that these students were studying in. I point that out just because this next phase is research, and I was really interested to see um, how the research that they do might or might not tie more closely to what they're studying um, because of the sort of shifted context of the project. So the way that we do this research phase in the class is that each student has their own Google Doc, and the research collection was spread over a number of weeks as they started to work on their projects and refine their ideas. The shared Google Doc files were used to maintain a research conversation between the two of us. So the green and blue spots, uh, those boxes are sort of my responses to their research. And this uh, is a practice that I would do pre-pandemic too, but I found that it was really an uh, incredibly important tool when we were working remotely to maintain contact with the students. And of course, not all the student uh, research was at the same depth or quality, which is always true. But of course, the pandemic increased some students' challenges to do their work. That said, the research was in this remote version of the class far more in depth than it had been and, and really more impressively connected to their projects uh, and where their final project would go, which was not always the case when they were um, studying things related to campus. The next phase was to prototype. Uh, and this phase asked students to provide evidence of the form that their project would take. So these ran the gamut um, from audio files to video to presentations to written work. This phase was late in the semester, and so I started to notice that some cracks were becoming evident in terms of students' um, students' ability to cope with online learning across a number of classes. It was really a challenge for some students. Um, and so that sort of struggle became evident in the prototypes, um, as you can see in some of the blank slides here. Final projects. Before I share the final work though, I wanted to actually share some of the scaffolding of the class just to give it a little bit more context. I'm asking students to think about sound across disciplines and to examine it through a number of different lenses. So for example, a perceptual lens, a psychological lens, or a social justice lens. So maintaining a through line that could keep them oriented online was hugely important. At Parsons, we use a learning management system called Canvas. It can be clunky, but I found that with some effort, you can really turn it into a cohesive launch pad for the course. It was important uh, to me to keep them within the course to not force any of those cracks uh, of attention any wider and to minimize jumping around. While the actual content was embedded all over the site, I used the home page as a kind of dashboard as some faculty call it, that enables students to very quickly see what's going on and to visualize the many parts that make up the whole. Something that is really tough to do as you are digging through a whole bunch of menus. I started the class off with more synchronous Zoom time and gradually the class wide synchronous time lessened. This was partially by design, but also I adjusted midstream in response to an anonymous survey I asked my students to fill out in the early weeks of the class. I wanted to ensure that amidst the load of all of their classes, that I was mindful of Zoom fatigue, screen attention spans, and the different learning styles of the students in the class. Some of the activities that were threaded through the 15 weeks were readings and online discussions, software demos, um, asynchronous lectures, and these I really started doing after that student feedback um, in response to that. Recorded um, tool and technique demos, for example, recording methods, and then visiting artists and virtual site visits. Uh, a number of these could be accomplished asynchronously, so I was able to really um, pare down the amount of synchronous time as a result. In terms of the setup for that final site sound project, it's important also to talk a bit about the project staging. Certainly there were the readings, lectures, etc., which I mentioned, um, but this brief project called Sounding Out 
work to set the stage for going out into the world. And here's a little description of this one week exercise. This project asks you to listen to and add to the sonic environment. In this short project, you'll not only be a listener, but you will add sounds to the soundscape. This requires a process of listening and responding. And because the sounds in the world are often unpredictable, you'll need to improvise. The project will result in recordings and photographs. So here's an example. Um, my student in Boston, uh, he recorded below a highway bridge, which was across the river from Boston's North Station train terminal. Um, so Peter listened to and then responded to the bridge using his voice and a variety of objects he brought with him. In this example, Rosabelle performed with the morning soundscape of Prospect Park in Brooklyn. She captured the occasional contributions as well of the uh, bikers, joggers, or dog walkers that came in the park in the early mornings. Um, also worth mentioning, because there's a certain recording component of what we just saw, the sort of necessary change in this relationship to on-site tools and facilities that we experience in a remote teaching environment. So in the past, we would have had an introduction to the school voiceover booth, and students would also have the opportunity to check out recorders to use in the field. Obviously, that was not an option, so we shifted to a recorder that most of us have with us all the time. There's an obvious deficit here um, in terms of things like quality or kind of professional methods, but you know there were some unexpected benefits too. There was an opportunity to talk about DIY approaches, uh, the value of having tools in the field that you can use really quickly, the way that the phone opens up access to most people, um, and also the role of sound quality, for better or for worse, it's an important um, topic to talk about. Okay, so back to the final projects. I'll quickly share the results of a few projects. So one thing I was really impressed by was um, this willingness to improvise and also just this getting out and um, having a conversation with the space that they wanted to work with. And I think that this really had a, a positive impact on their final projects. So I wanted to sh quickly share a few of those projects with you. Rosabelle, who you'll remember from the kitchen sink, explored issues of domestic space, routine like washing dishes, uh, the sound of what she calls grossness, and this kind of relationship between materiality and sound. She begins the work in an acousmatic fashion, um, which just means that the, the sound itself is separated from the ability to see its source, and slowly she brings the sources in visually. So bonus points to Rosabelle for stretching the pack capacity of her phone by putting it in a Ziploc bag to do underwater recordings. Peter, our product designer in Boston, chose to explore Binney Street. He became interested in the idea of electromagnetic transmission, urban noise, uh, and the idea of forensic listening. So how can our exploration of sound tell us things about a site that might not otherwise be evident to us? He built his own antenna to pick up the electromagnetic frequencies and captured the sounds with a recorder. And he mapped the kinds of transmissions he was picking up as he moved along different paths. His final work focused on this route. And finally, he created a map where you can simultaneously follow his journey while hearing and seeing the radio transmissions he encountered along the way. <laughs> <laughs>
curse you. I'm saying what I'm saying. Our class was happening in the midst of the presidential election, and one student, Sam, lived just down the street from Joe Biden's house in Delaware. In his Sight Sound project, he explored the disconnect between the media circus and its political rhetoric and the deceptive quiet of this suburbia. In his final project that focused on the disjunction between vision and sound, he created a Fluxus-like game in which a participant would follow a route, and upon seeing or hearing different things, they would trigger a different sound clip. For people that bad, it kept fair, kept fair, kept, kept fair. President-elect Joe Biden arrived moments ago at his event in Wilmington, Del- 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 Delaware. 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 He tested the project with his parents, who found it, quote, disorienting, overwhelming, and random. So um, Sam considered that a success. Susie in Shanghai chose a site that had a primarily elderly population. She was interested in how the demographic impacted the rhythms of the soundscape. The work drew on different kinds of themes like memory. Um, She also really engaged in ethnographic research, doing interviews, uh, field recording, and the work had a kind of documentary approach. So what were my takeaways? Overall, I was shocked by the transformation that happened in the projects. I could never have dreamed of the deep connections that many of the students would make to their sites and to the idea of sound and to their research. From what I could gather, the effort that I'd made to create a cohesive class, both organizationally and thematically, seemed to work. But what did I know? After all, I was the only one in the Zoom room who actually had any knowledge of what the class was like before when we were on site. So what did students think? I interviewed the six students whose work I shared in this presentation, and I was curious, what did they come away with? How did it align or differ from my own perception? So here's a few topics uh, with my thoughts on the left and then some students' thoughts on the right. The sound of where we are. I felt as if the shifted context of students doing local work wherever they were allowed them to connect to each other in different ways. This student says, so many people come to Parsons with different cultural backgrounds, but rarely do you get to see them in the places they're from or the backgrounds that form their ideas. It was kind of like getting to take a trip back with some of these people to their own environments. Depth. This local shift also seemed to connect the project more meaningfully to their own lived experience and to the way they saw sound where they were. Lockdown forced me to get out of New York City, and I know that's not the case for everyone. I think creating site-specific work in New York City versus outside is a drastically different experience, so I felt like I had more unique things to say or I had more content with which to say stuff. Sometimes when you're here it feels like everything has been explored, or like there's no stone left unturned, But when you're out in the middle of nowhere, it can be different. In New York, it feels always like the outside world is looking in. But it was kind of the other way around. Focus. This was in no way consistent, but in most of the final projects, there seemed to be more investment and more focused research and work. Some students mentioned that the isolation uh, of the pandemic actually allowed them to focus while others said that it really challenged their ability to focus and get their work done. Some mentioned that the lack of the commute was actually beneficial in their productivity. What about the asynchronous work? Well, I felt like the lectures and demos went really well and allowed students to connect in a lot of different ways. Some students responded well to being able to stop and start them, to do activity simultaneously, etc., but others, it just didn't mesh with their learning style, where they absorb more in an in-person context. The asynchronous work was, of course, really important to my student in China, um, and we could work out a schedule for her. Community. I find this to be one of the most challenging uh, in a remote environment, and attempted to do many things to bring the students together, but in the end, I wasn't particularly satisfied. Surprisingly, students felt that there was an okay class community, but no one expressed real satisfaction. No one's going to make friends via Zoom, the student says, you know, like in front of everybody else. Every conversation you have is for everybody to hear. 
communication. It's hard to have a good conversation on Zoom, right? Or is it just me? One student mentioned that Zoom is basically on or off. Either you have the mic or you don't. There's no room for overlap. Some mentioned that the chat-based critiques that I used were more helpful in getting more crosstalk. Some felt, however, that even in the chat, it was a little hard to be genuine, knowing that it was, quote, on the record. These projects are traditionally pretty open-ended, but I was unsure how that would be received in this particular online context. Students generally appreciated the openness, and in the challenges of remote learning, it allowed them to connect to the project. Students also mentioned that moving from more, cons more constraints at the beginning to fewer at the end was important. A student mentioned also that it might have been easy to get lost in some of these open-ended projects had there not been these kind of check-ins um, that I programmed in with the research docs. So that was good to hear. Despite the challenges, I believe that this class has benefited greatly from its online context, and students connected to sound in ways that were completely different than my past approaches. I have every intention of folding this learning into my methods in the future, whether they be on-site or online.